So hello, thank you so much for being here today and welcome to the fall 2018 Writing in the Disciplines panel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jessica Rosano. I'm the Writing Program Coordinator here at UNCA. Every semester for the past three <coughs> years, we've invited faculty from across campus to speak with first year students about what writing looks like in their disciplines. This semester, I'm excited to introduce Angel Carr from Neuroscience, Elizabeth Porter from Economics, Jackson Martin from Art, and Pia Mitchell from Philosophy. While writing studies is a distinct field with its own disciplinary conventions and body of research, the skills that you're learning in Lang 120 are skills that you'll be able to practice and use in your other classes as well. Too often, we think about English class as disconnected from other majors, from our intended course of study. So this panel is just one of the ways that first year writing instructors are attempting to help you make those connections. As you listen to the faculty panelists, I invite you to consider what you're learning in Lang 120 and how those skills might transfer to some of these other disciplines. I've asked each of the panelists to speak briefly with you about writing in their disciplines, and then we'll use the remaining time to respond to your questions. To save time, I'll ask the presenters introduce themselves. Um, as you listen, think about what questions you have for each presenter. You might even want to jot them down. We'll end promptly at one, so please try to stay for the entire event. If you have to leave, please leave quietly. And now, I'll turn the floor over to our panelists. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and start since <laughs> I've got the, the PowerPoint up. I'm Jackson Martin. I teach in the Department of Art and Art History. Um, I prepared a short PowerPoint for you guys uh, because I'm an artist. I'm a visual learner, so that's how I roll, I guess. Um, anyone recognize this person? <laughs> The dude, yeah, right off the bat. Why, how do you recognize this person? Big Lebowski. Right, it's Big Lebowski, it's a cult classic. In addition, it's, it's drawn extremely well, right? Yes, this is a graphite mm -hmm. drawing actually made by my uncle. Um, I grew up with my, my dad and my uncle. Uh, this, this ability to draw extremely well was surrounded uh, by me uh, growing up and this is what I consider to be the pinnacle of, of great art um, representing exactly what you see. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, their talent, their skill is, is amazing, uh, but it leaves no questions, no wonder, right? Uh, it leaves nothing for the viewer to do except for appreciate the skill and then walk away. So let's say you walk into a gallery and you see this an actual blouse hanging on the wall next to a photograph of the exact same blouse. And you're like, okay, what's going on, right? So you walk up, you don't read the text panel, you don't read the title of it, you just start to examine the work and you start to compare the two and, um, and you start to see slight deviations, slight nuances, and you realize these aren't the same blouse. And then you're wondering, okay, what's going on here? So then you read the title and it's an artist, uh, Zoe Sheehan Saldana, and the work is called Shop Dropping. Like, okay, shop dropping, that's an odd term. I don't know what that's all about. So then you read the text panel and you read the story behind it. Uh, this artist uh, went to a local Walmart, uh, purchased several items of clothing from Walmart, brought them back to her studio, and meticulously recreated them using fabric that she found to be as close to the pattern of the, the clothing that she was re reproducing as she could, even sewed the original tag on the garments, put the hangers back on them, and walked back into the Walmart, guerrilla style, and put them back on the racks. <laughs> so the thought, once you read the text panel, or my thought is, there's people out there that went to Walmart, purchased these <laughs> unknowingly, have these extremely handmade works of art for Walmart prices, no doubt, and it's just mind-blowing, right? So the combination of refined skill and conceptual depth is what makes great art. And that's what we in the Department of Art and Art History expect out of students. Uh, so the refined skill, that's easy to achieve, sure. It's practice, right? But conceptual depth, that's something that's not so clear cut. Uh, it, it happens through research and writing. So in the Department of Art and Art History, we offer three degrees, a BA in Art, a BFA in art, as well as a BA in art history, and we do partner with other departments on campus for other degrees, such as the, 
the BA in Art with Teaching Licensure and the Arts, Man Arts Management and Arts Entrepreneurship. Writing requirements uh, in each of these degrees is slightly different. Uh, and it really depends on the specific concentration, the specific instructors. Uh, but you can certainly expect to write artist statements uh, in studio art. You can certainly expect to write research papers uh, in art history. Uh, I require my Sculpture One students uh, to, require, uh, to write uh, artist uh, research papers every month on a living 3D artist. Mm -hmm. And I require my Sculpture Two students to draft a, prof a professional site-specific project proposal uh, which includes a written description of their proposed project. Uh, but the major writing component in art and art history, the major uh, writing intensive, uh, usually occurs in the capstone courses in our, in our department uh, for each degree. So the BA in art, the level four is the capstone course. So that's drawing for, that's photography for, that's ceramics for, that's when you do the writing intensive. Uh, what you can expect is researching artists, maintaining a journal, writing a final three-page paper, giving an oral presentation, and then that's all augmented by your body of work that you uh, exhibit in a group exhibition at the end of the semester. A BFA in art is slightly different. Uh, the capstone courses there are called Senior Exhibitions 1 and 2, and they occur after your Level 4 class, so you can imagine it's even more uh, of a rigorous program, so you can expect in-depth research of art and artists, drafting weekly writing assignments, writing a final 10 to 15 page research paper, and giving your oral presentation at the UNC Asheville Symposium. And then all of that is augmented by a larger, more cohesive body of work that you exhibit in a solo exhibition. The BA in Art History, uh, their capstone courses are the Senior Research Seminar 1 and 2, and uh, as an art history student, you actually write three research pa papers in these courses. The first includes initial investigation begun in the first seminar class, the second is presented at the symposium, and the third is an expanded and focused final capstone paper submitted, yes, um, by the three faculty members. Um, and then these are some common questions and answers, so I think towards the end, if you do have some questions that, uh, that you have, these are some of the things that came to mind that people always are asking about, and um, uh, we can go over too if you have questions. And finally, all this information is on our website too, so <laughs> if you uh, check out art.unca.edu, .uh, you can find all this information. Thank you very much. I'd like to point out that you noticed, uh, at least Elizabeth and I, I wasn't paying attention to Kea, rapidly grabbing something to write on as Jackson was talking because he said some beautiful things and oh, I, I could make connections between what you mm -hmm. were saying and yes. how it related to my discipline and that's why I'm on my phone, I'm not texting my friends, <laughs> not. Um, I was writing notes of things I wanted to share with you. So I'm Angel Kaur, I am an assistant professor of neuroscience. My background is in cell molecular biology and those kinds of classes are the ones that I teach. Uh, I'm also really heavily involved in the first year experience uh, committee on campus and teach first year seminars. Um, those are film studies seminars because I moonlight as a film studies person. Um, and the kinds of writing that you would encounter in different types of natural sciences environments would look quite different depending on um, what level you're at and what kind of audience you're going to be writing for. And so um, one of the things that I wrote down um, was your uh, conversation about the deviation in the blouses. And it uh, reminded me a lot about how much deviation can happen as you're communicating scientific information to different audiences. Mm -hmm. Um, the way that I was thinking about it is when I'm writing for other scientists, that's when you get the kinds of research papers that you might have to read in a science class that are dry and boring and irritating to read, and is this even English? Often it's just a bunch of jargon, but that's just the convention of the field. Um, there have been students at panels such as this that have uh, asked me the question of like, well, why is all the writing so dry then? Um, and some of it is just being able to communicate the kind of detailed work that we're doing requires a specific set of terminology. Mm -hmm. And once you start writing all that terminology down, then it gets very, is this even English? 
Um, but it's something that we have to do in order for us to be able to communicate the depth of work that we're doing. Um, that doesn't mean that we're only ever writing for other uh, scientists. We're often writing to talk to other audiences like you guys or someone else who might be reading the Sunday Times or whatever it is that people do to get you know, science information from popular media in this day and age. Um, those kinds of writing have to have a very different texture to them. The use of jargon has to be very different because your audience is really different. They're not going to know what NMDA receptor antagonism means. Um, if you're curious about it, come and talk to me. Um, but what they can see is the broader strokes information and how it applies to their lives. And this is where the deviation thing comes in. It is very much like the original blouse that was at Walmart and then the recreation that she made and put back on those shelves. There's going to be differences. There's going to be loss in the texture of what was there in one garment versus the other garment. So the science research articles that we read and write have a lot more depth. They are more specific to exactly what you did and what the results were that you found. So a lot of the writing is not opinionated writing, it's fact-based writing. Uh, what you find when you're writing for a broader audience is that starts to shift. I found that particularly compelling when I had a very high profile paper come out as a graduate student, and then I read the popular press articles about it. They were not getting the information right. So one of the things that I, as a faculty person in natural sciences, do a lot is task students with that translation process. I'll teach you some science, you read the science articles, and then I want you to generate writing mm -hmm. that actually reproduces the science without losing the texture, without losing the nuance, but without losing your audience too. The way that plays out in my classes, you're going to be constructing Wikipedia summaries that you upload into Wikipedia uh, based on primary literature research that you've done. You would generate summary articles that resemble review articles, um, that are, again, encapsulating work from the primary literature. If you do research in the natural sciences, your capstone experience requires you to do undergraduate research work in a lab for you know, two to four semesters, and then you write a research article at the end of that. That's that super dry thing that I talked about before. You have to learn the jargon and understand it well enough to string it into sentences that make sense to people like me. Um, and that's one of the pieces of writing that you can do. As a 178 instructor, I get students to look at films that have neuroscience themes and write film analysis articles about it. Very different audience, very different subject matter. Sometimes they are dealing with the science, so they still have to do that translation piece. Um, trying to think about if there was anything else I wrote down that I wanted to tell you about. Um, I think one of the main things about science writing is brevity. And so I will stop there and let you ask me questions after we're all done. <laughs> um, it, my name is Elizabeth Porter. Um, this is great, we have a really broad set of disciplines here. Um, and so unlike art and unlike natural sciences, I'm an economist, I work in social sciences. Um, but both um, things that both of the previous speakers have said absolutely, absolutely also apply to writing within economics. Um, what you were saying about, re what I wrote down was refined skill and conceptual depth. Um, first of like first you it, it, not necessarily all of this is happening at the same time, but you need both skill and then also, in addition to that, you also need to bring the conceptual depth. And so, with my own writing, it gets pretty deep. It gets super jargony. And likewise, as for your invitation, if you would like to learn more about open market operations or quantitative easing, let's not do it here. <laughs> um, so, in terms of what I what um, with this panel, I, I can talk about my writing, and it's probably not going to be wild and exciting unless you're another economist. And if you are, let's talk. Um, but. Um, for writing with my students, and they're you know they're not economists yet. Many of them will be soon. Um, what I what I see in my students' writing is is, is this this leveling, this 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 building, this um, tiering of writing. Um, I teach a lot of uh, 101 and 102 classes. Those can often be first year students. They can be seniors. They can be grad students. But we're we're starting at it's a principles course, and so there's writing in a principles course. Um, and I was thinking of what you were saying with refined skill. The principles course, the 101, 102 students, this is where you're getting the skill. Um, and then with my upper level students who are research, doing their undergraduate research, and I'm working with them in their research, that's where they're getting into the conceptual depth. Um, for my 101 students, the writing is about 
it's, it's, these are econ courses. This is about learning the tools that is that economists use. And the tools that economists use, what we do as economists is we look at problems and we try to figure out how to solve them. Um, and so 101, 102 is about learning the tools. I like to say the tools in the toolbox. Like, am I going to use a hammer for this problem, or am I going to use a screwdriver for this problem, or a crescent wrench? It's like, what tool do is going to be the best tool for the problem? And uh, as I tell, I ask my students, I said, has anybody ever nailed a, a nail in the wall with the bottom of the shoe besides me? Um, sometimes we don't always pick the best tool, but sometimes we use the tool we, we have at hand. Um, and so the writing in 101 that I, that I ask students to do, very, very simply, um, is I ask them to find something they're reading about in the news, and I want them to explain it to me using something they've learned in class. Um, like, use what you've learned to, to, to explain something for me. Take something that you're reading about in the news and that what is, how do you look at that differently now that you've taken this course? Um, what's, a, what's a different way, a broader way that you may look at that? And explain that to me. I like, I like to use the example with my students. I'm like, if you are explaining something you're learning in class, um, and you're going to use an example, like, okay, yesterday I read this article, or I saw in the news, or so-and-so did this, um, and how, how that relates to economics or how that you know, ties into what we're learning to class is this. Um, and so it's, that's that, that skill that, that you're learning in 101 or 102, and this is true you know, pretty much in every discipline. You're getting that skill of like learning the jargon, learning the nomenclature, learning the tools, and starting to use them. And then at a higher level, when I've got my, my, grad, my, um, my research students, um, they, that's when they're using the tools. And that's where, and I've, I just grabbed this folder off my desk because um, I'm meeting with one of them this afternoon. And with this student, it's like, okay, she's, the next step is she has a question. There's a problem out there that she sees and she has a question. Um, and she's gonna try to answer that question using her tools that she learned in economics. Her question is about homelessness. She sees homelessness, she sees it as a problem. She's like, what are the solutions? Hmm, maybe one of the solutions might be tiny housing. Is it worth it? And so she's using a, a, a beautiful tool. Well, for me, I'm an economist. She's doing a benefit cost analysis. What is the cost of, of providing housing through, for example, tiny housing to the homeless community? It's more complex than that, but it isn't. And what's the cost? What's the benefit? Should we? Yes or no? It depends. Do the benefits outweigh the costs? How is she going to do that? Which tool? She's going to write about which tools she's going to use. She's going to explain why she chose that tool and not another tool um, to answer the So I'm looking. It's like, what's your question? What's, what, what question will your research be answering? What economic tool are you using? We call it theories. What theories are you using to look at the data? Who first came up with this theory? Um, what did they use that theory to explain or to, to, uh, to what question to answer? Um, who else has been writing about what you're writing about? Um, and then we get into methodology and all kinds of other stuff, too. But when you boil it all down, writing in economics is about learning how to use the tools and then using them yourselves. So like what you were saying, the refined skill and then the conceptual depth. OK, um, I'm Kea Maitra, and I'm a professor of philosophy. So I will be talking about um, writing in the discipline of philosophy. Um, and um, I'm actually, I think it's great that we didn't quite uh, uh, design this, but it worked out well, because I think uh, what uh, Dr. Porter was talking about, you know, uh, writing as a way to reflect your learning of concepts mm -hmm. and tools in your discipline, in whichever class, you know, the way she uses. and. Um, that's what I would like to talk about is, um, you know, if I were to give a, um, a title for my five minutes, um, it's going to be writing as, a, uh, writing to learn, writing to discover, that would be. Um, and uh, by the way, I would also say oftentimes with my students, especially and with myself, um, I kind of, um, you know, I'm working on a paper or an idea has uh, uh, happened to me, I'm working on it, I force myself to give it a title, like make it intentional about, and I'll ask my students whenever I see a draft, like, where is the title? Oh, and I'm like, no, next time I see it, I want the title. Because I think that process, in fact, actually, is also very important in focusing your ideas. 
So um, I, I'm actually going to say two things. Um, one is how my, I think that kind of um, captures what writing is like for me in philosophy, um, is how my attitude towards writing has evolved um, from when, you know, I've been doing philosophy a very long time, but typically people think of writing as an end product. Right? You, you figure out ideas in your head, and then you kind of some kind of man, a manner in which they appear on a paper, on a computer screen, or something. And what I think, <laughs> and I am uh, so glad that you invited me for this, because I have realized that the best thing about writing is, and it doesn't matter whether you're a good or bad one, but just to get the best out of writing is the mind shift. Writing is not an end product. Writing actually is the act of learning and discovering. So that's what I have always, I think the, the you know, I, some writings I've done, I've published some things that I like, some I don't like, I like want <laughs> to hide. But the ones that I think are a little bit okay are the ones where they are clearly um, evident that I was using it as a way to learn. So I would say that if you can, and, and that is, I think, not just in philosophy. That's a skill set mm -hmm. that can be carried over. So then maybe the last couple of minutes, I, I'm, the other thing, um, well, in my classrooms, I, of course, use um, very much, you know, the others have talked about, you know, the refined skills, conceptual depth, or the fidelity to the original, as Dr. Kaur was talking about. I think those are all very, very important. Um, I think also I use a lot of low-stake writing, you mm -hmm. know, because the, so what, um, that's a jargon, I guess, but where I want to grade, actually. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I would uh, ask students to write uh, in class, and I would tell them ahead of time that I, you may have to share it, so don't put some things that you wouldn't be able to share, but, um, and then I also have another stage of writing where I will get it, I will look at it, give comments, but never grade. And then, of course, there are what I would call maybe high stake or more formal writing, right, that you, um, I also strongly believe in, uh, um, on uh, drafts, okay, <laughs> philosophy is about <laughs> writing, and I encourage drafts, and I think that's one thing about UNC Asheville, we are small, our professors, I think most that I know, my colleagues want drafts, so, um, so okay, finally, I'm going to talk about four values <laughs> that I strive for as a writer, and that also I like to cultivate in my students uh, in their writing. Um, the first thing is clarity, and if I had more time, I would tell you a story. But um, I think that, in, at least for philosophers, in my experience, um, clarity is undervalued. Originality is overemphasized sometimes. And I would actually say, if originality, yeah, originality is important, right? We are in America. Um, but uh, clarity is equally, if not more, important. And here is why. Because if your ideas are not clear, mm -hmm. If your ideas are not presented in a way that others can, and depending on your audience, whether it is scientific, if other philosophers, or common people, then whatever the originality quotient is, it's going to die. Okay, nobody will engage. So that <clears throat> the other uh, value, I think, I have come to um, kind of cultivate, and I like to um, you know, mention to my students as well, is the tone. Now, I am kind of a person who struggles with, um, my, my thesis advisor told me that, Kea, why do you back into a point? You see, I'm one, uh, because maybe also my mother language is somewhat like that. It's where I don't like to make com points directly. I kind of go to it. Um, so for me, I cultivate, I know that about myself. So I want to cultivate a confident voice. Not overconfident, but confident voice, uh, tone. So knowing that about yourself, about your writing, and then doing the appropriate kind of tone, I think is very important. That's a value I have. Also, the writing has to be engaging. Right? Writing has to be um, that it is that so you, not only that you have ideas and you're throwing them at the world, but you have some awareness of the world that you want to then engage. Um, and then, of course, I'm a philosopher. So for me, uh, writing has to, has to have strength of argument. What is the point? 
you are making and how helpful are you being in making the case to your audience. So um, those are some of the values that I strive for in my writing. I find writing um, invigorating, absolutely um, um, you know, um, empowering. I find writing really, really empowering. Also frustrating, and uh, mm -hmm. um, can can be many other th verbs I could use. But um, but writing is writing is us actually. We whether we are a mathematician or a philosopher or an artist. Writing is with us. Writing is communication. Writing is everything. So figuring out your who you are, yourself as a writer. You know, skills are important, but that kind of self-understanding also through writing and off writing would be great help. So I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> questions, I just want to add one more thing to what Kea was saying uh, about the importance of writing as a means of communication. I know there's probably a bunch of you that are like, well, you know, I can talk to someone and then I can tell them what I'm trying to say, but having to write it, like, I just, I can't stare at that blank screen. Um, I don't know why it took me so long <laughs> to get to this, but this summer I realized, hey, these things auto-dictate. Yes, they do. And that's a great way to get a first draft written. And I have done this lots of times because I am mm -hmm. also someone that processes by talking out loud. Mm -hmm. And instead of talking to another human, I just talk into my phone, and then suddenly there's a draft for me to work off of. Mm -hmm. And I unfortunately learned that when I broke my arm and couldn't type and still had to write. But it's kind of amazing. Uh, yes, thank you for bringing that up. But yeah. I'm also. And we talk but, faster. Yeah, but we all, these things things we all like, carry around obviously. with us constantly. And yeah. you know what? Don't undervalue these things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank the panelists. This has been wonderful. And I'm thinking um, just how lucky these students would be to be in your classes because uh, this is really exciting to hear all of this. Um, we'll open it up now for questions. Um, just if you would stand up and speak clearly so that the panelists mm -hmm. can hear your question. So let's go. Hi, my name is Brandon Morgles. Uh, I actually, uh, before I actually have a question for you, but I also wanted to get the uh, uh, the four values. I got three down here. I got clarity, tone, engaging. And strength of argument. Strength of argument. Yeah. Okay. I'll sit down briefly so okay. I can type this in. And okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was taking notes the whole time you guys were talking. This is great. And those, those four values, I, I feel like we, yeah. mm -hmm. we certainly, those are really important in art, and I would imagine in any discipline. Yeah, those are yeah. great values mm -hmm. to, to strive and for in writing. Thank you for bringing up revision. It's yeah. something that I know I code into my classes constantly, and I know I'm all in, yeah. I mean, yeah. most professors do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if you, uh, um, Jackson? Uh-huh. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Last name here. Okay. Um, for, uh, I recently did an infographic on photography and like pictures and things like that and writing and photography. Okay. Now you have one on art history, which obviously you have a lot of information to grab from that. Yeah. There's a lot written on it already. Mm. Now for somebody who's trying to actually, you know, write about something that they created, you know, since art and even like, mm -hmm. you know, philosophy and other things, you know, there's a lot of passion regarding that. Mm -hmm. uh, how, hey, scientists have passion too. We have comments down. Sing a lot. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, it, it was very difficult for me to find information about people writing about their own stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what, what kind of things would you tell somebody, one of your students who uh, well, was trying to describe like something like that on the wall, you know, that they created something abstract, maybe. Okay. Well, um, I, if if we were in a critique like setting, and I asked my students to talk about that work, that's actually Kelly Olshan's work. She was a BFA student, and I, I was I had her in my presentation. I, I tell them to just start with simple observations. Please just tell me what you see in the work. Like I'm talking line, shape, value, texture, the simple elements of art, principles of design. So I, I try to get students to start thinking about that. But to, to get students to start thinking about what their work uh, means and, and writing about their work, mm -hmm. I have them research other art and other artists. I have them scroll through the internet or go to a museum and whatever they're attracted to, just do the research on that particular artist. Read their artist statement. Read what they've already written about their work because it's something that you don't, most people aren't just born with the natural ability to write 
and do art. Most people, if, if, you, if you end up in our art department, you probably have some love of art that you've you know, honed over the years, and maybe you even have a natural talent, but writing is something that I've found that most of my students uh, cringe at because they that's one of the reasons why they've gone to the art department is, is not to write <laughs> uh, but in this day and age with seven plus billion people on the on the earth and who knows how many of them are artists uh, you you have to be you've got to be your own PR person so you've got to find a way of doing that and there, there isn't a, a right or wrong answer uh, but it is a process uh, and I that's where I would tell them to start is start researching other artists and how do they write about their own work uh, and then it starts to bounce back and forth that it's not you're not just going to find that, that kind of golden nugget of information and then just be able to write about it beautifully. It's going to be a back and forth process from making art and writing about art and researching and writing and making and writing and researching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. That's, yeah. A, uh, that's a good point. I had yeah. another project for a different class where right. um, um, my best friend is a local artist. He's got some stuff in an, ex in an exhibit in the, uh, in the museum mm -hmm. around town. And uh, I was filming him actually doing some of his art at okay. his studio at his home. And uh, I wanted him to try and describe it. So he was doing it as he was um, trying to describe it as he was painting and creating these amazing things. Yeah. And he, he just stumbled over every other word because yeah. he's not used to actually talking about what he does. Sure. I wrote an article much more detailed than he would have been able to give <laughs> because I'm, I'm looking at it from you know more analytical uh, viewpoint. He's, yeah, and, and he's probably really appreciative of that writing too. Now, <laughs> can I can I take that please for you right. know for yeah, my website I, or whatever to describe my, you know, my work? I gave him a copy yeah. of everything that I did. The so. other thing I was going to say about that is is the process of creating art. Uh, sometimes is it is an altered state in some ways. So mm -hmm. stumbling over your words while you're also trying to create art may not be because he's not articulate articulate in what he you know is doing it's just it's, it's two different processes in right. some way I can imagine if somebody was asking me about what I was doing while I was doing it I, w I would be stumbling mm -hmm. over my words too I mm -hmm. think. and I want to take that word that you just said process because you also mentioned this is writing as a process yeah. mm -hmm. um, and so with my with my research students who are about to graduate they're doing their undergraduate research that they're going to be presenting um, I really try to work with them to get them to be comfortable. I'm like, your paper, I'm like, I kind of, I mean, of course I care about your paper because I'm, you know, whatever, there's going to be a grade, whatever. But this isn't a bar, this, this, this process that we're going through is not about the paper that you're going to submit, it's about the process you are going through at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you said writing to learn, writing is a process, writing to discover. And so, what what I ask my research students to do when they're presenting their research and their writing, I'm like, tell me about the process. Mm -hmm. Tell me, this is my research question, and why this is my research question is because I was interested in this question because. And then when I started thinking about this question, then what happened was, and then as I started to think about what tools am I going to use, what theory am I going to use, this is how this is the, this is how I got to this theory. And then when it was time to use the methodology, like what method I ended up using was not the first method I thought I was going to use. And so it, it a, a big part of um, the research papers, which it sounds as a daunting 20-page, you know, senior research accumulation capstone paper. It's not that daunting because a lot of it is the process and when you're writing you're writing about that process um, and I, I found with some students explaining it to them that way I'm like tell me about how tell me about the process it, it I noticed kind of eases some of that that anxiety so the process um, and writing about the process I also have a few things in uh, response to, to add to what you were saying, um, things that came to me. This was another summertime revelation. I had a Yoda-like summer, so excuse that. But um, it was really transformative for me to learn that experts in the field, people that are getting MacArthur's Genius Grants and all these people, they still go out and read about what other people mm -hmm. do. I read this thing about Ta-Nehisi Coates when he started writing about Bla writing Black Panther. One of the first things that he did was go get stacks and stacks of comic books and do research. And that was really lovely for me to read because I was having this moment of crisis of if it's not coming originally from me, that there's something wrong with that, that I'm not actually doing the kind of work I should be doing. But everybody does research. And that's something that it lifted a lot of weight off of me. I hope it helps you too. Um, and the other thing that came out of our conversation was the importance of reflection, kind of across the board, collaboration, 
and revision and review. Um, at least for the sciences, I know this is not necessarily true for things like uh, um, processes like art, but in the sciences, you're never working alone. You're always working with collaborators. And what you just described, this experience of being able to capture your uh, friend's artwork while you were there as an observer, that's a wonderful example of what collaboration can do for you because you were able to believe in your friend and, and the work that he was doing in ways that he probably also can't do because we all hate ourselves a little bit. Um, and <laughs> artists especially, this whole idea of, oh, artists are out there and they're amazing and they have all their shit together. They don't. They're, they're struggling <laughs> with just as much as you are trying to get that paper for Lang 120 written and submit it to your professor. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to bring those points back in. That's good. Surely you guys have other questions. I gotta ask another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing with being a professor. We get really comfortable with awkward silences. And long, <laughs> awkward silences sometimes. So the importance of clarity was mentioned, and I think that probably applies across the board. And I was wondering if you could speak on how students can work to achieve clarity in their writing. I'm not, I'm not sure it's as easy said as done. I, one of the things that I um, tell my students to do throughout the process, but a lot of times it happens during the first draft. When I get the first draft of their paper and I read it and I'm just thinking, good Lord, you know, I, I get it right back to them before I even go through it because I, I can't go through it. I say, go to a mirror and read this aloud. Okay, read yeah. this to yourself read or or maybe you've got a group of people. Read it aloud to somebody yeah. and immediately they'll come back in a few days and like, oh, I didn't understand a word of what, what I wrote and part of it's... It's, I guess the internal dialogue is very different than, than speaking yeah. it aloud. Yes. That helps with clarity, I yeah. found. It's the number one thing that the writing consultants do in the writing center as well, is make you actually read out yeah. sentences from your writing back to yourself. Mm -hmm. My mirror is named Clay, and I call him like, <laughs> do you have five minutes? He's like, yes, okay, I'm gonna read something to you. And he doesn't say anything, I just put him on the phone, and I read it aloud, and, I've, it's, and I'm sitting there with a the screen in front of me, and I just read whatever I just wrote <laughs> aloud to Clay, and I correct as I go along, yeah. and, and after five minutes, I'm like, thank you. And he's like, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he does the same with me. It's nice to have that one person. And he's a lawyer, so a lot of times, yeah. He'll say things, I'm like, Clay, that makes no sense. He's like, well, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, you're not allowed to explain it to me because whoever you're writing this to, you're not gonna be able to explain it to them. So I'm like, I don't care if it's lawyerly jargon that I'm supposed to know, I don't, that's the point. You need to translate that. It was clear that she's not talking about an actual mirror, right? <laughs> it took me a minute. <laughs> it took me a minute too. Right? Yeah. Okay, okay. It was the phone <laughs> gesture. Yes, yeah. okay. yes. It's not a mirror. Um, yeah. And one of the other things I'll say about clarity is, um, often what you can do is step back and rephrase what you're trying to say in language that's very comfortable to you. Hmm. If you're going outside your discipline, especially science-y stuff, it's really easy to get caught up in the jargon and you lose what, what you really mean. So there's a lot of times where I'm going through um, documents that students have written and I just highlight things and say, what do you mean exactly? Mm -hmm. Rephrase this for me. And it's okay if that first draft, and you can tell your professor, hey, my first draft is gonna be a little rough because it's written in like my speak, mm -hmm. not using the right words, but I'll go in and change that later. I just wanna see the quality of the thought that's there. So. And I would rather the student turn that in rather than something that looks like they just took sections of a paper and like, you know, ran synonyms and changed a few words. Because let me tell you, I can tell when that's happened. And that doesn't, it doesn't show what you're thinking at all. Mm. Um, let me also add to that, because uh, I was the sort of the culprit <laughs> bringing up clarity. Um, for me, clarity is uh, both a matter of um, uh, mechanics as well mm -hmm. as content. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I had a uh, graduate professor um, who always said that your paper, a good paper, is one which can be boiled down to three sentences. That's the, that's the core, and then you add three, and then you add three. Do you see that the, the process is that you never lose the core, mm -hmm. but it's this you know, going out cycle. So I think um, uh, th that thought, if it, uh, if it helps you think about, but for me the way that I work it is that um, clarity is not just, you know, is, is your idea clear? I mean, that's kind of obvious, you know, and those are, you know, reading out loud and all are important. I actually, maybe because I'm a philosopher, I just 
read to myself. Um, but uh, where I think clarity also is important is mechanics. Do mm -hmm. you do your? Uh, is this all jumbled up? You may have individual good ideas, but are they offered in a progression in a way that your audience can? connect to that, you know, if you are um, able to, uh, so that's the, what I mean by mechanics, is your paragraph is, uh, for me actually clarity is um, progression of ideas, also clarity is about okay. um, how much you tackle in a paragraph, mm, and so also in a paper, also in a book, maybe in a life, but that's not to be discussed here. Mm. Um, so, and then what I mean by clarity of content is um, finally asking yourself that, you know, I think we have all been there, asking yourself that hard question. Yeah, I have like 10 ideas. I have one mm. paper to write. Mm. So sit yourself down and say, okay, which are the ones that I have to let go? But that's why I, I ask my students, I have idea file. I have lots of ideas there that I couldn't use in this paper. Mm -hmm. It's not gone, it's, it's there, but it's not used now. Uh, and I often go back from idea file to see. Um, so uh, one thing about clarity, one of the exercise that some of my uh, students, um, especially upper division students have, uh, have said worked, so hopefully maybe it'll work, it works for you guys too, is that I just say, if somebody has read a lot, right, philosophers tend to read a lot, read a lot, you're not writing, right? And that's worrisome yeah. because you then lose your voice, you don't know what you're saying, okay, this author says this, all that. So I just say, so they're like, oh, we don't know. So I say, okay, five, for five days, you have to promise me half an hour every day. Doesn't matter what time, half an hour, you will just take either on the computer or on a piece of paper. You'll sit down and write down at that moment how your project appears to you, right? So half an hour, just that day. And then next day, again, half an hour, time yourself how you see your project that day. You have to do it five days. I don't know, I didn't come up with it. I didn't standardize it. I think five days is enough that you have gone through, then you read. And I can tell you that there, you will emerge, a voice will emerge, a, a kind of a direction will emerge, a question will emerge. So that, in my opinion, you are clearing. You know, that's like, um, you know, polishing the diamond, kind of. That's what you're doing. What it is that you want to say. So that's what I would say about clarity. That's good. Yeah. I'll say one more thing. Clarity, for me, is never achieved all in one night. If I'm writing something, I have to give it time. I have to let it simmer and come back to it and revise and give myself a break because uh, I think a lot of a lot of students and people just want to kind of hammer it all out at, all at once, and I think there are probably few people who can who can do that. But mo for most of us, it takes time. So allowing that time for revision, uh, the clarity will come. Mm -hmm. Who else? And it could be something you find yourself struggling with. I could sit here and go on forever about what I struggle with with writing, but it's probably the same thing. That would be why we're all taking so many notes, is because we all have to write for our lives <laughs> all the time. Nope. And any hacks are good hacks. Thank you, sir. I really got questions. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to be writing a uh, paper here soon that's uh, it's more geared towards the um, uh, the more science and, and business side of things. And what would be some advice, because I've already gathered a lot of that information you were talking about, which mm -hmm. has a bunch of jargon. I'm actually already interested in that stuff, so I actually understand quite a bit of the jargon. What's, I mean, I, I know transitions and trying to, you know, uh, to write something that somebody can actually follow um, is one thing, but what are some ideas that you might be able to give me for uh, making sure that I don't just throw out too much information that nobody's going to be able to follow? Mm -hmm. I think considering your audience would be a number one thing to do. Who are you writing this for? And what's the purpose of the writing? Yeah. Um, beyond just I'm writing it for my professor for a class, right? Like what, who are you, who's supposed to be reading this? The audience for this is essentially going to be an academic okay. uh, audience. 
And so now you have the, um, the freedom to use some of that jargon without over explaining it because you're writing for other experts who would have some understanding of what's happening. Um, but going through uh, and thinking about, as we were talking about, the, the sort of essence of what your argument, argument is going to be mm -hmm. and then organizing the information with that, I would say outlining is going to be your biggest friend for a paper like this because you're combining information from so many sources. Right. Um, and if you can find someone in the audience that you are trying to write for and have them review it, mm -hmm. um, that would be really good. Mm -hmm. okay. Other ideas? You have any thoughts? I would say, you know, what I was going back to, of, it depends. If you, if you want to make sure you're not using jargon that somebody wouldn't understand, pick up the phone. Find mm -hmm. somebody. Yeah, to re that's that reading it aloud. Um, and then basically just supporting what you were saying, like if there is a specific audience you're, you're writing to, um, find that person to, 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 to ask them to review it. Um, I am very thankful to my colleagues for, I, I don't do anything without first sending it to one of my colleagues and saying, mm -hmm. will you read this, will you proofread this, will you tell me that I don't know, like, that I, I'm being clear or unclear. Um, and and I'm, words we had written down that you were saying reflection, collaboration, mm -hmm. review, like, if you, if somebody does you the favor of, of reading your writing, you then owe them that same favor and you start to, uh, yeah, you start to get a, a group, you start to get a bunch of people, of uh, friends, and I have them, um, who will do you that favor and who will review your work and I will do the same for them. Yeah, you build may, that collaborative. You may consider metaphors using um, stories or metaphors to describe that's what you're idea. talking about, just so um, if you want to bring it down to a different level, not down, that's a bad word, um, to a different level. So mm -hmm. that, um, right, I was just yeah. thinking, uh, I was thinking along those lines, but then that would go back to what you were saying about uh, losing the depth of uh, mm -hmm. the detail that you're trying to uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm skilled enough <laughs> as a yeah. writer to really uh, pull, uh, pull off too much uh, as far as the metaphor, but uh, I mean, it's worth giving a shot anyway. Sure. Yeah. And you're probably better suited to see this is what happens when you ask a question, y'all. You get like super specific advice. Um, this would, uh, I was going to say to you specifically, uh, you're probably better suited to start much more in depth than you really need to be. Mm. And then you can refine back and say, okay, this seems like I'm explaining this way too much. I don't need to go into this much depth here. I can kind of allude to it and uh, move forward. Mm -hmm. But really, what you're being tasked with is prioritizing the information in your research um, to best support whatever it is that the purpose of your paper is. Mm -hmm. um, with all of my, my research students, I, I literally make them create at the bottom of their paper a place called the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And when you have things that you're working on, you're like, wow, this is, this is not going the way I wanted it to, or it's too much, or I don't think it's relevant. Don't take it out of your paper. Just move it into the parking lot. Yeah, like just move it, yeah, just move it. To, what I learned about the parking lot about five years ago, man, changed my life. I'm going to use that if you Right? <laughs> <laughs> the parking lot, it's still there, but you're just moving it. Yep. And I tell my research students, I'm like, your paper will most likely be at least 50% parking lot at least 50% parking lot. And so that's, that's where you put your things that you're not happy with, or you're like, ew, or that's, oh, uh, or I don't know, uncomfortable, or I think that's not real. Parking lots are great. Parking lots are a great thing in your paper. And I think it goes back to part of what K.O. was saying with regards to having the ability to refine the work that you're mm -hmm. doing yeah. for clarity, tone, and engagement, and, and so on and so forth, because that's what the parking lot ends up being. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, one of the things that I do is if I feel really stuck, I go into a different document and yep. I outline with my silliest voice. I'm super sarcastic. I have this very strange sense of humor. Yes, you do. And I have that <laughs> list, like the way that the writing happens is like I'm just talking to myself. Yeah. Um, and that helps me get past whatever fog it is that I'm stuck in and feeling like I can't move forward um, while doing something that's really helpful, which is reorganizing an outline. But I get to that's be sarcastic while doing it. I'm going to steal that. That's See, great. we're stealing from each other. <laughs> the importance of talking about writing, mm -hmm. right here. It's not stealing, it's collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> the importance of words, Kaya. The importance of words. Yes. Anyone else want specific advice? Yeah. Yeah. Do any of y'all um, engage in writing outside of your discipline? And if so, what is that experience? How has it affected your writing? 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, yes. <laughs> Maybe this is the first time I will acknowledge it on the UNCA. Um, <laughs> No, I, I guess we all do, a, a, mm -hmm. you know, kind of um, self-discovery kind of writing, you know, journaling mm -hmm. or other things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, 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 I yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is not being very helpful, right? So, um, yeah, I'm working on a memoir. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, and uh, how I got started, I think part of it is um, sort of finding my philosopher's voice, actually. You see, mm -hmm. my graduate director, this, uh, uh, this is advisor, saying, yeah, why do you back into a point? Why not? Those are good points. Why don't you just make them? I think that allowed me to realize that, that, that I, I, even though I may present a different persona or something, I have, uh, I, I, wor I worry about confidence and voice. And when I was in that process, I also got maybe too emboldened to start this process of uh, writing about uh, myself or my life or what I think or something. So yeah, I am, and that is not philosophy. But what I will tell you is that in that process, that made that, mm -hmm. and I have a file, big fat file, but that may never see the light of the day in the way of seeing light of the day in publishing or somebody else, mm -hmm. um, you know? But I think what has happened is that has also been like the fourth wheel in my writing. So in my philosophy writing now, some of the questions I ask is actually transported from that part. So even though these are two different things, um, you know, the tone is different, I'm trying, a, uh, I'm not that worried about uh, argument and things like that um, in that other thing, but it, it does impact you. So I do think that uh, those mm -hmm. of us who, uh, who do, and I actually am absolutely amateur, there are other folks, especially in the literature department, who are, you know, creative writers, but also does, you know, maybe academic writing, or folks do that, mm -hmm. um, I think you will notice that, um, and in fact, in my philosophy, I was trained as a philosophy of mind person, but I do now more comparative philosophy, the feminist philosophy, so, you know, I was keeping things compartmentalized in my head and in my writing. But more and more I've seen that they have come to the in, permeate each other. And I think that does happen to people. So. That's great. That's nice. I mentioned at the start that I also teach film studies. And so the kind of writing that happens in that is very, very different than like mm -hmm. hard cell molecular biology, understanding mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and I don't do professional writing in film studies yet. It's something that I'm playing with because I've been refining mm -hmm. this particular class and I'm thinking about maybe there's something there to create a book out of it someday. Um, but it does mean that I still do engage in film analysis and writing form, even if I'm just communicating with students. Um, I am not like you. There are no compartments in here. Everything's totally jumbled. And I find that uh, that can be a huge strength because I can see things that connect to other parts of my life and work experience in ways that I wouldn't be able to do if my mind was more compartmentalized, which is why I can like pull things from our panel, mm -hmm. um, be in any meeting and be writing down notes about a different thing because things are sparking um, how that's happening. It gives me more confidence in my science writing because mm -hmm. um, I'm just producing more. And it's one of those things like Kay said, if you just, just you're writing, um, it becomes mm -hmm. more normalized. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I've done. And what we haven't mentioned is we all write syllabi and course instructions and, and emails. so many emails. <laughs> and I've gone to the writing center more a number of times than I can count with mm -hmm. my um, oh, me too. instruction sheets for me too. writing projects so that I can get someone else to weigh in on, does this make sense? When a student comes to you and gives this to you, will you know what I'm talking about? Um, and that kind of writing can be really, I mean, it can be meaningful just because then you have papers that make sense when they come to you because you wrote your <laughs> assignment well. <laughs> yes. I don't know if that answered your question very well. Yeah. Well, I want to honor everyone's time. Um, thank you so much to the presenters today. Thank you for students for yeah. being here. If you have not. <laughs> if you have not signed in, please do sign in on the sign-in sheet so that your professors know that you were here. Um, and uh, I hope
hope this was helpful. It was helpful for me. I was taking notes as well. So thank you so much. <laughs> Before you guys run off, I just want to make sure that I've got your names. Thank you.